Hi, I'd like to welcome you to week two of the St. Aidan's Institute course on Anglican theology. Um, our first question this week, and, the, and the, the readings you're doing, is very interesting because it's going to show um, part of the breadth of the issues that the patristics were dealing with. Um, we, we see it as one time period, but in reality they were dealing with lots and lots of different um, and very different problems. If you're ever to read Irenaeus' uh, Against the Heresies, that entire book is just him going down a shopping list of heretical groups, one group after another after another, and him arguing why each one really is heretical and does not capture um, the essence of what Christian faith is all about. And uh, in this, this week's reading, you're going to look at one piece of it, and it's his battle against the Gnostics. Uh, the G in the word Gnostic is silent, so it's kind of a strange word. If you're not sure what the Gnostics are, they were believers in a Greek term called Gnosis, which is wisdom. And they believed in secret wisdom, that the Bible was good, that, that the teachings of Jesus were good, but you can't do a surface reading, that there's a deeper meaning, and only certain people are enabled to either capture what that meaning is or even understand what that meaning is. And so a lot of the work of the Gnostics was the pursuit of secret wisdom. That may seem quaint to you, but Gnosticism is all the rage today. If you were to read or have watched the movie The Da Vinci Code, looking for secret clues, looking for secret formulas, looking for secret messages, that is very much the task of the Gnostics. Always looking for something more. Always looking for another conspiracy uh, that only they are uh, able to understand and, and decipher. Um, but uh, hand in hand with that went uh, a worldview that was ground in the Greek philosophical um, dualities of good and evil. And in one of those dualities, the material world was seen as awful. It was gross, it was disgusting, it was um, crass and carnal. And what was instead to be desired was pure intellectual spiritualism. And so when we look at how earthy Christianity is coming out of Judaism with the physical elements of bread and wine in the Eucharist, with the idea of the body of Jesus coming back from the dead, and the idea that when we rise, it'll be our bodies that are raised, they could not tolerate the idea that things so base and so materialistic as human bodies could have anything to do with the great spiritual realm of the universe. And so Irenaeus, in arguing with the Gnostics, is one, trying to break them free of the Greek philosophical worldview, which was the dominant view of the day, and help them see that Christianity is talking about something much bigger and much grander with the nature of God's creation. But also that this is available to anyone. It's not a matter of secret wisdom. It's not a matter of um, of, of being one of the few initiates that gets what's going on. It, that creation is good, that the material world is good because it was created by God, and it's open to anyone that wants to accept it. Now, contrast that with the arguments that Augustine was making uh, a, a couple centuries later uh, a, a, against Pelagius and, and Pelagius, who had a very solid, uh, a very positive understanding of human nature and life. He didn't accept the idea of the fall. He felt that the sins of Adam and Eve were limited to Adam and Eve themselves and that we don't have to worry about forgiveness of original sin or being plagued by original sin or succumbing to the same temptations that Adam and Eve succumbed to. Um, Pelagius didn't think any of those things mattered and or were important. And Augustine w spent a lot of time and energy taking that whole concept to task and arguing about how overwhelming temptation can be, how deep the struggle toward holiness can be. One that didn't seem hard for Pelagius, but certainly was hard for Augustine and certainly hard for, for almost everyone that's ever lived. And you, you would think in reading this, that Irenaeus and Augustine are dealing with very different perspectives on the same issue. But as Hall will point out, that's not the problem. The problem is they're dealing with very different flavors of heresies, that they're actually showing a consistent message, but um, dealing with different problems and how they share that message. And if you're ever going to have any grasp of the patristics, this is a very important piece of that puzzle. 
it's not just understanding what they're writing, but it's understanding who it is they're responding to. Uh, because if you don't really understand that, it's, it's going to be harder to understand why they're making the specific cases that they're making. The same can be argued for understanding the letters of the New Testament. If you don't understand who the letter is written to and why, then um, the letters make are much harder to decipher. Or to put it another way, if you don't understand the questions being asked, then the answers given uh, won't make as much sense. So we're going to get a very good exercise in that with our first question this week. And then the second question, we're going to look at Chrysostom and his understanding of God's providence. And it was so seminal and foundational for those who followed him uh, that a lot of our understanding today is directly traceable to it. So we want to spend some time there as well. So um, read the, the text carefully. This is the hardest book you're going to read in this class. Uh, so it takes a lot longer than the other books. But stick with it because it's, a, it's, it's well worth the time and effort that you invest. Alrighty, God bless you. Have a great week and I'll see you in the classroom.